A traveling exhibit is set up at City Hall in Plattsburgh that tells the story of some of the most historic shipwrecks in waterways across New York. The Great Shipwrecks of New York's Great Lakes showcases a dozen shipwrecks spanning more than two centuries. From the oldest intact warship in North America in Lake George to Benedict Arnold's gunboat from the Revolutionary War that sits nearly perfectly preserved on the bottom of Lake Champlain. It also features a steamboat that sank in the St. Lawrence River a century ago. The exhibit is free and open weekdays from 8 to 4 in the second floor atrium of Plattsburgh City Hall. It will be up the entire month, running through Friday, April 28th. And joining us now to talk more about the exhibit is Dave White with New York Sea Grant and Mark Malkoff with Lake Champlain Sea Grant. Welcome to you both. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Dave, tell us about the shipwrecks that are highlighted in this exhibit. You know, we're excited that the great shipwrecks of uh, New York State's uh, Great Lakes, and by great we mean in quotes because it really includes all of the lakes, is uh, on display here in Plattsburgh. It was uh, designed for the uh, 2014 New York State Fair, and the nice thing about it is it includes interpretive panels with two shipwrecks for Lake George, Lake Champlain, Finger Lakes, Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, and the St. Lawrence River. So there's 12 different shipwrecks across New York that are highlighted with some additional information on understanding shipwrecks, why do we have so many shipwrecks, and the nice thing by having those 12 highlighted, it really talks about the history of New York, which is, I often tell people, the history of New York is the history of the United States. It started here, began here. We have such a wealth of maritime resources that the exhibit really can begin to bring that to life, be it, you know, French and Indian War, Revolutionary War, War of 1812, you know, commerce, you know, movement of people across the state. So it provides that window into, in, into our history that a lot of us don't get a chance to oftentimes talk about or see if you're not a, a diver to get out there and see them underwater. What are some of the shipwrecks that you highlight? In the you history? know, and, and some of the shipwrecks we highlight are some of the most fascinating ones that are, you know, world renowned. Uh, you know, we've got the Ontario in Lake Ontario, which is an extremely historic, one of the most historic shipwrecks. They call it the Holy Grail of Lake Ontario. You know, uh, down in, in Lake George, you've got the Radeau, the oldest intact warship in North America. You know, right here in the backyard, Lake Champlain has Benedict uh, Arnold's gunboat on the bottom, still intact. And people often forget cold, fresh, deep water keeps these wrecks just as they were when they went down. So it does provide us that great window of how did they design them? Uh, you know, what were they being used for? You know, a lot of canal boats. So you can go through all the different generations and just see this wealth of information that, you know, and again, because a lot of folks aren't divers, it can bring that to life to them. And roughly how many shipwrecks are there across New York? all together. Uh, you oh, know, yes. in, in, in the exhibit, Thousands. it actually says that, you know, there's over 10,000 shipwrecks really? in New York. Uh, you know, and again, yeah, that includes, you know, everything from a little dinghy to, you know, some of these fascinating vessels that we talk about. But and dating back centuries? Centuries. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Are divers today still discovering more shipwrecks? Oh, absolutely. All the time. Yeah, I, we, we, we call it the wreck of the year in some cases because there's actually a lot of uh, enthusiasts, especially now with um, side scan sonar, ROVs, and the new technologies, and they're finding them in deeper water. Um, and so, you know, every year there's a lot of people that, you know, they've, they've gone diving, they've moved on, they've built homemade ROVs, and they're actually out there looking to find them because, again, each one that they find adds to the fabric, that, that thread of what's that story and how does that fit into either our military history or, or the development of the country. I mean, we're yeah. celebrating the 200 anniversary of the Erie Canal system and you know how that opened up to the rest of the world is New York's history is U.S. history so you know when you add that piece in and there's many wrecks across the canal system as well especially in the lakes that one would now go through and that they went through so it's finding those as well so there's a lot of folks out there that, that love it and Lake Champlain is uh, Maritime Museum is going to be announcing uh, a new site this year that'll be part of their dive program as well. Of course, they've been diving on shipwrecks for a number yeah. of years. Mark, the most famous, of course, the Battle of Plattsburgh and from the Revolutionary War. Those are the two most famous naval mm -hmm. battles in the shaping of our nation. Shipwrecks from those still are on the bottom of Lake Champlain. Sure. Um, there's groups of vessels that you could talk about. Uh, obviously, the military vessels are, are really important. Pretty well documented history of, of the uh, confiance anchor being blown off in the Battle of Plattsburgh and really nice job of conserving some of those materials that are on display now in City Hall. Which folks can see on the way up to yep. the exhibit <laughs> right. on the first floor of, uh, of City Hall yeah. in Plattsburgh, yeah. the, the anchor that's been restored. Right. You mentioned, you know, divers still finding shipwrecks today and there's, there's a uh, really easy way to understand how this stuff continues to be found and, and that's the technology. You know, magnetometers and side scan sonars were the 
property of the military 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Those technologies are in the hands of private individuals now. Mm -hmm. And with, you know, with that just analogous to our computers and cell phones that we're using every day, you've got technology that's becoming more affordable that is, you know, thousands of times more powerful than, mm -hmm. than the best stuff 20 years ago. And with the advent of that kind of technology, I, I expect that, you know, wrecks in Lake Ontario, maybe materials in Lake Champlain are yeah. going to continue to be discovered. A lot of the materials that remain um, available are hidden in the sediments. Mm -hmm. So things like magnetometer, even if you've got scuba gear, uh, magnetometers become important in mm -hmm. terms of trying to find this stuff. Also, the interrelationship between the ecosystem that we talk about, we talk, we could talk about invasive yeah. species, and when you talk about zebra mussels when they were coming into the system, Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, in partnership with several of the folks up here, um, actually went out and did a full lake assessment of trying to find where are the hard hits that you know might be a wreck, it might be something of yeah. significance in advance of zebra mussel infestation, because they were worried in some cases that some of these could disappear either through colonization or actually collapse, and so by having those hard hits, they're now able go back out and if they see one it's like wow this is really an interesting one we think it could add in they're able to go back out having found that hard hit on the bottom because you know it's like we see it's, it's not like there's a, a nameplate on many of these so they've got to go out and really do that assessment as to what did they find but zebra mussels and the concern that they were going to have on shipwrecks actually pr you know prompted them to go out and do that the yeah. concern is that the zebra mussels coat the yeah, shipwreck yeah. and over time it would deteriorate. It uh, would deteriorate or you just coat it and they don't even know it's there anymore because it's you know it's become a rubble and you think oh that's just a pile of zebra mussels you don't know what's underneath it. Zebra mussels is one concern as, as far as invasive yeah. species. Uh, are there other threats to the shipwrecks as yeah. they sit in the in the water now because we've heard for so long that the reason so many of the shipwrecks are left right where they mm -hmm. are is because they're so well preserved right. in the cold waters of Lake Champlain. One of the things we don't have here in the way of invasive species are quagga mussels, which are very first cousins to zebra mussels, uh, but they can survive at much deeper um, depths. Mm -hmm. uh, zebra mussels kind of peter out at 60 or 80 feet. Quagga mussels can survive apparently at 400 feet. And Art Cohen, the founding director of the Maritime Museum, just gave a talk a few weeks ago on the Spitfire, interesting dilemma there because currently that thing's not, it's deep enough that it's probably not threatened by zebra mussels, but how long or when do we get quaggas and, and what, what do you mm -hmm. do between now and then to, you know, to try to, to deal with that. The other thing that um, is, could have an impact on these materials is climate change. We've, Sea Grant's funded some work to uh, document um, what's going on in the water column temperature-wise in, in Lake Champlain. We've got a buoy that was uh, placed last year out in the main lake and it will be out there again this year. Mm -hmm. Get real-time water temperature data throughout the water column um, and uh, any computer to see what's going on there. And, and Dr. Eric uh, Leibensberger at SUNY Plattsburgh, who's in charge of the project, has been able to go back and look at some records from the 80s that were collected by uh, uh, researchers at Middlebury College and he's starting to detect some some changes in the in the lake temperatures. Mm -hmm. So this we've always talked about cold, clear water preserving um, shipwrecks. Well, invasives in warmer water are on the horizon, and maybe we just need to be paying a little more attention when it comes to documenting, conserving, protecting, and studying the, um, these shipwrecks. A lot of people would say, well, you know, the lake's really yeah. deep in that, and so for those deep water wrecks, probably yeah. not, but really those nearer shore and that less than 100 feet, which you start to see those changes, that's where you can begin to see that deterioration yeah. and the changes really begin to occur, you know, again, over time as we, as we move forward. And Mark, yeah. you talk about the shipwrecks, obviously there are other concerns, and Sea Grant works on a number of projects mm -hmm. when it comes to the lake, to the watershed, to the environment. Uh, if you're seeing an increase in the water temperature, uh, that probably raises other concerns about uh, algae growth, algae blooms, what yeah. impact it has on fish species. Yeah. You folks for a number of years have been studying uh, the fish in Lake Champlain. Uh, of course, the fish are uh, very popular with sportsmen, with fishermen, the big draw for uh, fishermen from yeah. across the country that come to the fishing tournaments in Plattsburgh. Yeah. And you've been participating in a number of studies uh, over the years to really evaluate the fisheries and, yeah. and take steps to make sure it stays strong. Yeah, it's pr probably hard to, to uh, get into any specifics relative to fisheries and climate change. W one thing we do know that you're, you are setting the stage for um, more invasive species problems. Um, 
fish that, that normally wouldn't do well at this latitude, you know, you warm things up, fish from southern areas are, are more at home. Does it potentially threaten uh, the existing species, your, your, your trout and, and your bass and other fish that are there now? Yeah, uh, well, a classic cape, a case of that right now is, is alewife and smelt. You know, alewife were not native to Lake Champlain, not native to the Great Lakes either. Uh, we didn't get them until about 2003. Now they're doing quite well, thank you. And the losers are sm the native smelt. Uh, they compete directly for food sources and habitat utilization. So alewife populations coming up, smelt populations are going down. Um, no question about it. And Dave, for New York Sea Grant, yes. much the same. You work on a number of projects uh, having to do with boating safety, having to do with invasive species, really uh, protecting the waterways of New York. Because we have these just wealth of resources, you know, including the Finger Lakes, you know, Great Lakes, Lake Champlain, Lake George, is they all have different ecosystems. So there are actually things native in one body of water in New York that are not native in another. And when they do get a foothold, if they're being transported as well. So it's not just, oh, the invasives coming from Europe or coming from somewhere else. It's we want to be cautious what we're transporting, you know, within our own state from body of water to body of water. And, you know, and that's where, you know, you start talking about, you know, boating safety, invasive species, you know, clean, drain, dry on your boat. It seems within the past five years or so that, that there's really been a wake-up call to keep invasives out. And so just really helping people understand that, that, you know, back in the day it wasn't something we thought about. But also, you know, back in the day we weren't taking boats from one end of the state to another within a three-hour period yeah. to fish here and then in the morning and then fish over there in the afternoon. So our uses have changed as well. So it's just, you know, adjusting to that and sharing that kind of information with folks because you know once you share that with folks and they go wow that makes great sense because mm -hmm. because people are going to be saying yeah I don't want to be transporting something from Lake Champlain to a lake in the Adirondacks or vice versa.